All right. Um, my name's Luke Maduna. Um, I'm the Big Game Program Manager with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, yeah, just welcome to our, our winter big game meeting um, that we've, uh, this is the second online one that we've hosted. We've got, we've had, I believe six other uh, in-person ones spread around the state. Um, so this is part of, part of what we do to, to talk to and listen to our hunters and landowners and, and general public. Um, we've got a number of staff uh, joining us tonight. I think I saw our um, uh, uh, director on here, uh, Tim McCoy. Um, but then we've also got a number, at least a couple of our commissioners, Pat Bergeron and John Hoggett, um, are on here. And then Alicia Hardin um, is our wildlife division chief. Uh, Pat Molini um, is our management section um, uh, assistant administrator. It's assistant administrator uh, in wildlife division management section. I think I saw Joel Jorgensen, who's in our RAI section, our research section uh, for wildlife. Um, and there's there's a whole host of other uh, wildlife division staff that are on here that um, if certain questions come up, I'm, regional questions or different species, I, I, I may call on them um, as we go along. But I'll, uh, I'll get started. A um, little bit of uh, housekeeping stuff, uh, just some Zoom instructions if you're not familiar with it. Um, we'll try to keep everybody muted. Um, and if you want to turn your video on, you're fine. Um, sometimes that, that messes with bandwidth and can slow your connection down. Um, you can sure turn it off. It's no big deal. Um, that button is, those buttons are down there to turn that off. We're on if you want. Um, most of what we are for comments and all that we'll do in the chat. That has seemed to work really well for us. Um, you hit that chat button, it'll pop up. Um, sometimes, you know, over on the right hand side, sometimes it's a, a different box, but um, that's a great place to enter questions and all that stuff. Um, yeah, and you can you type them in there and then submit. Um, and as you can see, with as many people as we've got, we've got 116 people on here right now. Um, so it'll be it's it's kind of busy. There's, uh, yeah, it, it, it's kind of tough to have a full open forum. So that chat works really well for that. Um, and if you need to change the view, if you just get focused on just my face popping up, or if you want to see everybody, you can toggle through. Um, I, Totally get it if you're tired of looking at my face. Um, so our basic meeting format here is um, our primary focus is going to be big game, uh, talking about whitetail and mule deer, uh, elk, pronghorn, uh, turkeys, and bighorn sheep is kind of what classifies as, uh, as big game. I actually don't have a slide on sheep. I should have added that. Um, I'm going to work through what I refer to as a quick slideshow. It's It'll take a little bit, 45 minutes or so to get through. And then we'll go through some uh, questions and comments. Um, this is your meeting for us to uh, to hear input, um, or if you got questions on on what's going on, um, we'll uh, we'll work through that. Um, we have one one basic rule here: is just be respectful. Um, you know, it's family friendly event. We want to uh, just keep it that way, um, and uh, yeah, just be respectful to everybody here. Um, like I mentioned in the chat, submit questions and comments. Um, I'll work through the list uh, as we you know when we get to that point. Um, and everything entered in the, the chat will be included in our meeting notes um, and our meeting notes that all goes to um, our administration and commissioners um, after these are all done um, and our wildlife staff we all take a look at that so um, if there's uh, and I guess if there's something you want to say or it's just hard to convey um, or if I don't understand your, your question I'll you know call on you and pull you up when you can, uh, you can turn your audio on um, and we can work through it that way. Um, so for big game in Nebraska, our big game management goal is to manage big game populations at levels consistent with social and biological carrying capacities and provide opportunities for aesthetic enjoyment and hunting. And really what, what that means is that we look at, you know, not only the biological side, but the, the human, the social side, like what, um, you know, what hunters want for, for, for wildlife, um, what the general public wants for wildlife, what landowners want for, for wildlife numbers. We, didn't, we take all that into, into account in addition to the, 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 the biology. Um, you know, and so in all that, you know, our decision making um, process, you know, we take that input from our landowners, hunters and public, you know, through meetings like this and surveys that we do um, and co comments and other input that we get um, throughout the year, you know, whether it's different. Sometimes it's one on one meetings, sometimes it's other group meetings, um, sometimes it's, you know, emails, uh, phone calls, other, th other things like that. Um, we also look at the biology, you know, age structure of our, you know, the bucks and bulls of our, that we harvest. Um, the buck to doe ratios, fawn calf production, um, you know, for, for our herds, we do look at those things and include that, that info. 
Um, we also look at research that we've got going on, um, you know, whether it's some elk or pronghorn collaring stuff where we get uh, survival data, and I'll go through some of that here. Um, and we also look at diseases and parasites that pop up, CWD and uh, hemorrhagic disease, um, brainworm, other things that, that might impact wildlife uh, or our big game species um, throughout the year. Um, and we also look at our season results from our hunting seasons, you know, changes in harvest or success rates are, are important in that. We also look at the harvest makeup, you know, what percentage is... Uh, um, is uh, made up of females or antlerless only. Um, and then, you know, we, we do use some population modeling uh, to reaffirm um, some of those population directions that we're, that we're looking at. Um, and just for a quick overview, you can see the two maps of Nebraska. You know, these are our, our deer management units in the upper map and our administrative districts. We're broken down into four districts, uh, um, Northwest, Southwest, Northeast, and Southeast, you can see those those uh, districts and um, how we're broken up as a, a as an agency administratively. Um, first off, we're going to talk about turkeys. Um, so we did have some recent changes uh, for the 2023 season in the, the spring season. Um, we had we added mandatory uh, telecheck uh, like deer where you've got to report your your turkey harvest um, and it works right through the, the same system as as deer does. Um, and you can you go in and you record your harvest. Um, the other thing is we did change the daily we, we or one thing we added was a daily bag limit of one bird per day uh, to spread out our harvest. You couldn't fill um, fill both tags in, in a single day, which we did um, drop down to two permits per person from three. We'd previously been three for for a number of years. and with the decreasing populations, um, we had we had brought that opportunity down. Um, and then the, we did uh, add a non-resident cap of 10,000 permits. We, we did notice that our non-resident uh, turkey hunter numbers um, were actually outpacing our resident numbers um, and had kind of had increased significantly over the past, oh, eight or so years. Um, so we did kind of take that back to a little more uh, uh, tolerable number. Um, and we, we took that back to about where it was previously to 10,000. Um, so, and for the fall, again, we've got mandatory telecheck, got to report your turkeys when you harvest them. Uh, limit of one permit um, that was down from two and a bag limit of one turkey on that permit, which was uh, down from two as well. So we basically we went functionally from a, a fall limit of four turkeys down to one um, this past year. And we also reduced our season dates down to just the months of October and November. Um, previously had been September 15th all the way through January. Um, and again, that's in response to the changes in populations, um, which is down. Uh, we, we use the real mail carrier survey uh, as an indice of our uh, Turkey population um, from our peak in 2009, we're down about 52% um, at this point um, from the 2023 survey. Um, so you can see how, how that trend goes down. And it, it's it's been, you know, over the last 10 years since 2012, we, we've seen a decline. Some of that is probably the drought of 2012 impacted that. Um, we also likely had some some poor nesting years there. Um, and in the early 20 teens, we had some really wet May and June um, there in, in 2014, maybe 2015, if I remember right. Um, and so that can negatively impact uh, nest success. Um, so our harvest, um, you can see how that's changed over time. That top one in the spring, it's I, I've got the rural mail carrier survey, that blue line uh, overlined with that. So you can see just comparatively how the our harvest um, went. And you know, a lot of you, you can see there in 2021 um, when we had a lot of non-residents. Um, come back and hunt Nebraska after being um, not getting that opportunity in 2020. Uh, that was kind of the point where we realized that we were definitely out of whack with where we wanted to be. Um, because, you know, as you can see, that that permit trend, that green line was, was generally following um, our population numbers. But just with the, the drastic increase in non-residents, it definitely spiked um, at that point. And we realized that we did need to make some change. That wasn't that the hunters weren't following that same trend as, as the, the turkey populations. Um, and so this past year, our harvest did decline 25%. And that was basically based on the, uh, the season changes that we made just going down to, uh, um, to, to two permits instead of three. And some of those reductions we made, you know, capping the non-residents, we did reduce um, our permits and the, the, the quotas about where we, uh, and the harvest about where we want it to be. Um, we also do have a, a, a brood survey that we do each year. We, have, we do have really good um, public participation. It's open to the public uh, during the months of July and August. Our, our participation this year was down a little bit. Um, the, the number, the, the participation we had in 2022 um, was quite amazing. The, the public 
um, and staff uh, reported or recorded uh, right around 9,000 total turkeys. Uh, we we're still just under 5,000, um, you know, which is still as higher, higher than most of the years when we were doing the survey um, years and years ago. Uh, we did restart this survey in 2019 um, after a, a 15 year hiatus of, of not doing it. Um, and it's provided some good data uh, for us. Um, you can see where our, our brood numbers are. They were down a little bit this year, but they're still in those uh, historical um, numbers. We're, we're still very comparable, you know, in our, our uh, brood production and, and our poult per hen number. Um, we generally like to, you want to keep that above two. And we were, we were still above two this past year, even though they're down. We've uh, in the past few years been real close to three um, poults per hen overall. Um, and so the, the, uh, two poults per hen is the the general metric across the nation um, that you kind of need to keep as a uh, as a replacement um, or the, to achieve replacement on on the the, the landscape. Um, there's a number of states that are struggling to meet too. A lot of states are actually down in in the one um, area. We're still faring pretty well in brood production um, for for where we're sitting compared to the other states. Um, not that we're uh, doing as good as we'd like, but we're still it. it, it could definitely be worse, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, and so, yeah, it is uh, comparable to uh, historic data. And, make sure. and yeah, um, please consider participating when we we put that out. Um, the easiest way to find that at that time of the year is just go to our website and hit the search bar and type in Turkey Brood Survey, and it'll be the the first the first line. It's easy to find, um, pretty easy to participate in. Um, so we do have some turkey research going on right now. We've got a, a big uh, project. It's going to last a total of, of five years. We've got three years of research. Um, we're just starting um, year two. They're actually, I believe, uh, the first capture is going to start uh, next Monday. Um, so they're just in, uh, just starting uh, year two on this. Um, we did capture turkeys in northwest and southwest Nebraska, so up in the Pine Ridge, and then down in the Trenton, uh, Colbertson area. Um, this past year, we did have a uh, pretty decent nest success. We had 48% in the Northwest and 37% in the Southwest. Um, normal uh, success rates for, for Turkey, uh, for turkeys is in the 20 to 40% in most other uh, research. That's, that's pretty normal. That's, you know, that's kind of the average. So um, we, we did fare pretty well um, with our, uh, with our nest success this past year, despite the the heavy rains and flooding they had in the southwest at that time and just everything else that's going on so it will learn um there's a lot more to be learned over the next uh um the next several years on this project there'll be three it'll be three total years of captures and then they'll have two years a year and a half of of uh completing the uh data analysis um so yeah there's yeah two more years captures and a uh, lot more info to come so it'll be uh, quite interesting to to see what goes on with that. Uh, we'll move on to deer. Um, and as, as everybody kind of knows, our deer numbers are down a bit. Um, these are the preliminary or just the results from our November firearm season, uh, the overview. So overall, we had just uh, about 28,000 deer checked, which is down 16% from last year and down 19% from the five-year average. Um, our mule deer buck harvest was down 20% um, during that season. Um, and our mule deer antler antlerless uh, harvest was down 49%. A lot of the mule deer antlerless harvest was down um, largely because of the, the, the permit cuts that we, that we did make this last year. Our whitetail buck harvest was down 6% and 21% down from the five-year average. Um, the whitetail antlerless harvest was down 31%. Some of that is uh, um, permit reductions, but some of that was also, I believe, the, the weather. So yeah, like I said, that's just the preliminary results from the November firearm season. Um, we'll have some different results and I'll get, I've got one more page. So they'll talk about that. Our units did, um, did vary, uh, quite a bit. The Southeast buck harvest was basically even, um, and some of the other parts of the state, you know, a lot of the other, the Western units, a lot of those were, were down. Um, but yeah, it, it was highly variable. There's not just a, I mean, not a major pattern to a lot of that. Um, I do think that the warm weather uh, had an impact on the antlerless harvest. It was 10 to 20 degrees warmer for almost the entire week. Um, so I think there was a lot of hunters that, that chose, rather than to interrupt their hunt and take a doe, um, they couldn't just, you, if you shot a doe that week, you couldn't just go hang it in the shed and uh, and, and go hunt that evening. You're going to have to take care of your doe. So I think that um, it probably impacted some 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 of the antlerless harvest. 
Um, and obviously, like I said, we, we do know that our, our, our populations are down. Um, and so hunters laying off of harvesting does during the firearm season may, may be a bit of a blessing in disguise um, for some of the areas that, uh, that need less doe harvest. Um, and so, and we'll see, we'll get more information um, at the end of the season here um, at the, at the end of the month as things start to wrap up. Um, and you can see, you know, over time, we did reduce some of our antlerless tags. We've uh, reduced the last two years. Um, last year was about a 13% a reduction in our antlerless. Uh, at this point, I believe our either sex and buck only permits um, were down about 9%. Um, some of that's just simply due to reduced quotas and that non-resident reduction that we had uh, put in place. Um, trying to find a place for my, there. Uh, so I, I was able with, with the close of the, the archery and muzzleloader seasons at the, uh, the end of December, I was able to crunch a little bit of information. Um, overall our, our buck harvest, um, was down, uh, 6% from last year and 27% from the, the, the peak there in 2019. Um, our mule deer buck harvest was down 22% from last year and down 53% from that peak in 2017. Um, so like I said, some of that is due to, to permit changes. Some of it's obviously, you know, very much due to, to populations just being down. Um, but we'll, we'll get more information as we, uh, as we go on. Um, our buck age structure, uh, we do most of that, you know, through our tooth wear and replacement um, I, I am still waiting to get our, our 2023 data um, out of our permit system, um, but from 2022, we, we aged uh, about 16,000 deer, um, which is 48% of the deer that, uh, that came through our check stations um, during the November firearm season in 22. So we do have a really good idea on the, the age structure of our harvest. Um, I was able to look at that inside spread info, information from our, uh, our check-in for, for 2023. On the whitetail side, it was 22% uh, age class one. Um, and on the mule deer side, it was 10% age class one, which is really close, very similar to what it's been in years past. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at that um, here in the coming weeks when I'm able to get that uh, info out of the, the system a little bit, a little bit better. Um, but yeah, it's still, still work in progress there. Uh, one of the, the quick things on our special landowner deer season, you know, that Saturday to Monday before the November firearm, um, overall, we sold uh, just under 3,500 permits, um, which is pretty similar to years past, um, and then harvested just under 800 deer. Again, very similar to, to years past. And the, the harvest percentages of, you know, of bucks and does and all that um, is very, very almost identical to what statewide archery and youth permits are. Um, and as you can see, the, the, the blue is our, our limited landowner permit, and the orange is the overall uh, harvest for that special landowner um, season and you can see it, it it appears to be somewhat compensatory with that landowner permit um the the overall landowner harvest has decreased about the same almost exactly the same amount as the the rest of the permits have decreased statewide um so the, this permit hasn't been you know ultimately additional harvest there's very few uh landowners who are killing deer in both this this season and the the limited you know the the regular firearm season um th those that are using this special season uh, tend to be just hunting that one and, and not killing a, a second deer or additional deer in the the um, the November firearm season or or throughout the other parts of the the, the year. So um, that that's been an, an interesting thing to to see. So um, I guess some of the other things on our deer um, and just some of the things that have impacted, particularly our mule deer. Um, our staff does a, a mule deer composition survey in uh, December and January. Uh, we go out and classify deer herds each year. We classify between three and 5,000 mule deer across Western Nebraska. And you can see the last two, uh, two years, 21 and 22, our, our fawn survival or our fawn, uh, fawns per doe uh, has, has dipped significantly. Um, even starting in say 2020, um, it was down, I guess, you know, around 60 there. Um, we, we had been, you know, in the hovering around 70 for a, for a long time and even a little higher than that for a number of years. Our fawn production, just with, with the drought and everything, fawn survival was was probably not very good. Um, that's just going to simply uh, just going to impact how quickly our populations can recover um, from, from uh, or how quickly our, our, our populations um, can grow and respond to, to other things like uh, drought and hunting harvest and, and, and all of that just not as productive these last couple of years. Um, so that's definitely played a role in our, uh, our uh, um, 
mule deer decline. Our whitetail uh, composi composition survey actually use our, our, our advertise it to our bow hunters to, to record what they see on their sits. Um, and, and that survey, the, the first year we did, they did classify about 5,000 deer for us. Um, it's been a little less. It's been about 2,500 each of the last um, three years. The, the, the fawns per hundred does has been, it's been about 60 fawns per hundred does, um, each year, uh, which re, re, remained re, remarkably steady. Um, and that's decent. I, it would, I would have expected it to be in the, the you know, seventies to eighties. Typically whitetails are a little more productive than, than mule deer. Um, our buck to doe ratio from that for the, the first, uh, three years of it was, uh, in the low forties, 40 bucks per hundred does. And then this last year it was up around 60. Um, there it's, it's a little strange that that jumped uh, so quick. I haven't had time to really analyze that data to see what might, uh, have gone on with that. I I'm not so sure some of the warmer weather doesn't play a little bit of that. And just, I, I need to see how much of that was in, uh, November when the bucks are moving and the, the, the does typically do not, they, um, just during the rut does, uh, just by nature, don't move as much. They wait for the bucks to come find them. So there, there is some, there's something going on there that, that I didn't, I wouldn't have expected that to jump uh, like that this year. So, um, but yeah, we do collect some of that data. Um, some of it's staff driven, like the mule deer survey. Um, and then we've got that hunter survey. And if you want to participate in that, I, it's labeled the bow hunter survey simply because I stole that idea from uh, the state of Iowa. They do a, a a survey they don't actually ask their hunters to classify deer they just get counts to as part of a uh, population index you know just the number of deer seen per hour um but i figured we could use our hunters to to classify what they're what they're seeing out there and provide some of this this good information for us um again just go to the the search bar type in bow hunter survey um you go to the the web page there's a button there you scroll down a little bit and it'll take you to this uh form and you can uh enter an observation for for each hunt that you do um and that helps us a bunch so yeah, if you're you're out and interested in doing that um, next year, uh, we'll run it again, and uh, please participate. Uh, so I'm going to run through a few of our common deer questions. Uh, a lot of them tend to orient around uh, deer trophy quality, and quite often it it starts as a, if we only did blank, we'd be just like Iowa and Kansas. And you know, quite often it's you know move the firearm season to December. Um, you know, ultimately, there's more to buck quality than season dates. Um, and Kansas and Iowa are an easy comparison since they're our neighbors. Um, you know, the, there's other contributing factors when it comes to buck quality. The most important part of that is buck harvest, simply the number or the proportion of bucks uh, that you're shooting. If you shoot a, a smaller proportion, if more of them survive uh, the year, you get to you you end up with uh, um, more older bucks. It's it's a pretty simple math equation. A bit of a tongue twister to get out, but um, the other part of it too is uh, habitat, both above and below ground. Even the topography plays a role in that. The below ground is just simply becomes nutrition. Um, that's what that's about. But the above ground, if you've got better escape cover, and that you know topography plays into it, um, better escape cover for deer to to avoid getting shot. That uh, that helps them survive another year. Um, hunter and hunter density um, can play a role in that. If we've got areas, and we we see that in in, in Nebraska, the the Units and counties around the metro areas uh, tend to have a lot higher percentage harvest and tend to have uh, lower age class um, for some of our uh, for some of these these eastern units. Um, another part that plays into it is simply culture. You know, the Kansas and Iowa have have uh, been managing for trophy deer. It's kind of become a, a part of their culture um, throughout the years. Um, you know, they've learned uh, long ago. If you know. Uh, let him go, he can grow. Or, you know, if you pass a deer this year, he's going to be bigger, you know, going to be bigger next year if he survives. So um, there's just some different things, some differences that, that play into that. And season structure can play into that some. Um, you know, there, there's the the assumption is if we moved it to December, then they'd be less susceptible, which it, they might be a little bit less susceptible. But um, there there's some other things that that that, that play into that as well. Um, so some of it, why do we have our season, you know, during the rut, some of it's simply tradition. It's been, um, in and around the rut since 1957. Prior to that, it was actually in December. We moved it to, uh, to the no early November timeframe at that point at the request of hunters. Um, they, they basically request the hunters at that point requested us to, uh, consider moving it because they didn't want to hunt post-rut bucks that had lost a lot of weight. 
Um, and they moved it forward and the deer weighed like, you know, 17 pounds more is like, seven, they increased body weight, like 7% or something like that. Um, you know, the, the, the biggest thing about hunting during rifle hunting during the rut is, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. It's the best time of the time to hunt. The rut's a ton of fun. You get to see stuff that you're never going to see the other times of the year, the deer, the bucks are moving. Um, it's a ton of fun. And the archers, I mean, that's, that's the biggest time when when archers get get their harvest 50 percent of archery whitetail buck harvest happens uh in those first 15 days of, of of november um so it's yeah there's there's a there's no arguing that november is the simply the best time to hunt um the weather is also 10 degrees colder um in in december um this year was a, a weird year it was warm in both november and december um but there's some years we we get some major cold snaps in early december that would make a pretty miserable deer hunt um it also hunting during the rut tends to be safer hunters tend to uh sit still um instead you know a common tactic over in iowa is is doing deer drives well you you'll put up you'll post up a couple hunters at the end of some habitat and have a bunch of hunters push through it the thing with that is it does put hunters um in dangerous situations it puts other hunters out in front of guns um, the other part of it is a majority of our hunters want, want that firearm season, uh, in the rut. We actually, oh, I'll get to, I get the survey coming up on the next slide. When we look at a bunch of the other States, most other States have firearm seasons very close to where we do. There's only a few States that, that really do it in, um, in December. Um, so we're, we're, we're not alone. Um, most other States, uh, are very similar to where we're at. Um, the other part of it is it's not a biological decision. Our fawn production is good, like I, I showed other than the last couple of years. Um, the other part of it, too, is our adult doe uh, breeding is, or I should say fawn production is good. The fawns are hitting the ground. They just may not be surviving for a number of other factors. You know, the drought played a huge role in that these last couple of years, particularly on mule deer. Um, the adult doe breeding um, is not spread out. We have a very good uh, birth pulse. And you can see this, this is actually from a mule deer research project we did a couple years ago uh, in both the Pine Ridge and Southwest Nebraska. Um, the interesting thing here, it's, you can see that there is uh, two distinct um, pulses between the, those two areas. The, the uh, does in the Southwest uh, gave, essentially gave birth and therefore went into uh, estrus about two weeks uh, ahead of those in the, the Northwest. And that really likely has to do with just spring green up. Um, their timing, uh, their fawn drop to when the um, there's good nutrients on the ground um, and they can produce good milk to to feed their fawns. Um, but you can see there's that, that we really don't have a, a trickle rut going on. Um, you know, with with our mule deer there, um, the 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 hunt, the firearm season happening during the middle of that isn't impacting um, does getting bred uh, at all. There's there's very few that 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 are getting bred after, after that. And with, with that mule deer research project, we, we collared a hundred and or two, I think it was 240 does by the time it was all said and done. And we only had one that wasn't pregnant, um, throughout that whole project. So it was, uh, a, a lot of those were really did quite well. Um, and it, the other thing, thing too, is our, our buck age, uh, structure at our harvest is, is comparable to other Midwest States. Uh, you can see the national deer association deer report where, where, uh, most other states um, report that Kansas and Iowa actually don't uh, record age at harvest, so we can't really compare to them. Um, but if you look at Indiana, um, who is ar arguably producing as, as many or more Boone and Crockett uh, bucks per buck harvested, um, our age structure is right uh, where their theirs is. Uh, they're a shade better. We're, we've, we tend to be about 20 to 22 percent um, yearling bucks in our whitetail harvest. They've been 16, 17, so we're not terribly far behind um, in that regard. Um, and like I mentioned, you know, the win um, isn't as important as the number of bucks uh, being harvested, um, ultimately. Um, some other parts or things to look at is firearm success rates are only marginally different in Iowa and Kansas. Um, our firearm success rate is about 40 percent. Um, Iowa is a little bit lower. Uh, Kansas is actually a little higher um, despite their season being in December. So it doesn't really change. Moving the season, you know, may not change that that uh, success rate, which really isn't going to change uh, the number of bucks being harvested um, on the landscape. Um, and the other part of it, too, is the states that have December firearm seasons uh, tend to have much higher uh, archery harvest as a percent. Um, Iowa has 60,000 archers. We have 16 to 20,000 um, in Nebraska. That makes up 40 percent of their, their their deer hunters over there, and they account for 20 percent of their harvest. Um, 
Kansas, uh, unknown total of archers, but it makes up 40% of their harvest. Ohio, uh, it's 47% of their harvest. Uh, Minnesota, um, uh, 14% of their hunters are, are, are archers and 14% of their harvest. Um, and for us, we're about 12% of our harvest is, uh, is from archery. Um, Looking at our uh, just the public input on when the season is, we actually asked the question, you know, when do you when would you like the, to see the season or would you like to see the season move? Um, overall, 71% uh, of our hunters wanted it to stay where it was. 29% wanted it to be moved. Um, when we look at some of that, even across the, the archery hunters, it's still a majority of them wanted it to stay where it was. Um, when you start breaking it down, do, would you like it earlier? Would you like it later? Um, obviously the, the archers, you know, majority of them would like to see it later. So they get a little more of the, or of those that, that asked, or that said they wanted the season moved that a lot of those 80% of them wanted it later. Still there's 20% of them wanted it actually earlier. When you break it all down, um, 71% of our hunters wanted it to stay the same 12% wanted it earlier in the year and 17% wanted it later. Um, so it's definitely, uh, a, a large majority want it to, uh, uh, want the season to stay where it is um when we asked that that survey question in 2020 um the other question we get is you know why do we have two buck permits um it does provide a you know a lot of opportunity in the state we've got both whitetail and mule deer um in the state it does have a relatively low impact um about 20 percent of our residents and 10 percent of non-residents purchase two buck permits uh annually um and in 2022 uh 1.8 of uh, of all buck hunters killed two uh killed two bucks so it amounted to about 1500 additional bucks killed statewide that's five percent of our total buck harvest um amounts to about two bucks per 100 square miles um with that uh, I, I have looked at some of the age structure of, of those harvests and there's really no age uh no difference in age structure in the first or second um or only bucks taken by by hunters with one or two permits um they're all about 20 percent yearling bucks um and so ultimately hunter, hunters generally shoot the same size of buck whether they have one or two permits or whether that's uh their first or second buck um for 2022 the, of those hunters that had two permits uh the success on their first permit was about 32 percent and their success on their second permit was nine percent so there's there's not a lot of hunters are, are filling that second permit some of it it may be that they're they're holding out for a a bigger buck or or, or whatnot um but you know, the, the success rate on those permits is, is generally pretty low. Um, it ultimately it comes down to kind of a cost benefit. We're trading 5% of our buck harvest for, you know, functionally double the opportunity for those people that, that want to get that second tag. Um, and really, if we got rid of uh, that second buck tag, the, you know, those harvest rates would equate to a 1.5% a change in our survival. You know, so if, if buck survival was 75%, it would drop, or if it was 73 and a half percent it would go up to 75 percent um you know so it would be a pretty minor change uh in our overall buck uh buck survival in the grand scheme of things so there's a lot of social considerations uh to take into uh or things to consider there um hunter desires you know what does the public want to do you know the other part of it too is the high-end management you know if you're if you're managing um you know a, a property uh, this doesn't give you the chance, you know, and I write coal buck there, but like if you've got a, a six year old that's a, you know, three by three or a four by four that's not getting any better, you really don't have a chance to take him. You've got to, you know, if you're trying to, you know, really manage your property and going after a, a, a big buck, um, you, 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 you kind of got to keep feeding that unless you want to, unless you can find somebody to take that, that other buck with, with one permit. So, um, you know, that's, that doesn't apply to everybody, but there, if there's people that want to really pay close attention to managing their deer and, and shoot some of those, uh, the, those deer that, you know, aren't going to meet what they want for goals. You really don't get that if you go to a one buck, um, option and you, you know, the other, the other part of it is just that overall hunting opportunity. Um, you know, and, in, in, in some cases, you know, we have limited, uh, to one, to one permit per person, you know, when, when demand has exceeded supply, like for the, those MDCA permits, um, we, we have made that, that change, um, you know, where it's been needed, where we've seen, uh, seen that, um, you know, a lot of these things are, are really social issues. Um, you know, there's trophy management, firearm season dates, hunting opportunity. 
they really aren't biological uh, needs based. Uh, they tend to be hunter preferences. And so some of these changes or these types of changes, you know, kind of got to be grassroots in nature. They got to come from from the hunters as a collective and, and everybody want to, um, you know, kind of pull in that direction. You know, and so, uh, you know, it would have to you know come from, you know, just a organized hunter um, desires, you know, and it's not just going to be an, an impulsive change that we would make um, in a single year. So it's there's a lot that goes into those things. Um, so just suggestions for, for better deer, um, where you hunt, you know, ultimately the quality of deer, uh, where you hunt is the culmination of individual choices. You know, ultimately it's you that control your trigger. Um, if you let him go, he can grow. Uh, you know, everybody, the, the saying is if I don't shoot him, somebody else will, but ultimately, uh, that somebody else was probably going to shoot a buck anyway. So instead of one buck dying in that case, it's two bucks dying. Um, so if you pass him, that's one pass deer. If you know, if you eat your permit to not shoot a smaller buck that maybe you don't want to shoot, um, there's going to be one more buck that survives, and it may not be that buck, but it's it, it's another likely smaller buck. Um, the other thing too, you know, if your neighbor's happy with their deer, let them be happy. You know, there, you know, it, it, there's no point in fighting over this. But it, it, if they aren't happy, if they're complaining about the quality of deer, just politely remind them that you know they're the ones choosing to shoot that that deer. If they let him let him go. Um, you know, that's how you get bigger deer, but is by passing smaller ones. Um, and if you're happy with the deer you shoot, great. You know, that's, that's, that's what everybody wants. Um, the other part of this too is, you know, uh, if everybody, you know, work with the private landowners to see how you can ha help with, uh, help them hold more deer. Um, you know, that's a, a, a big part of that is just, you know, we got to work, you know, Nebraska is 97% privately owned and we've all got to, you know, play our part in, in helping manage, um, deer and you know one of the big things deer deer can cause damage that's never going to go away we've got to work with landowners to to help solve those issues or help mitigate them in, in some fashion um you know and ultimately it's not it's it, it's about having or shooting the right number of deer um that the property and the, the landowner can support um you know so it's just we, we've all got to look at our properties where we hunt and figure out you know do we, do we need to raise our harvest do we need to back off or do you do things like that um, so a few things to remember, um, deer on TV are fake, you know, not every deer in Iowa is a giant, um, you know, that's, that, that stuff that shows up on TV really isn't applicable for, for 99% of us. Um, and really we're all deer managers. We're not simply consumers. We're not going to the grocery store to pick out the, pick out our buck and, you know, being unhappy with the quality we've got to, we've all got to work. Um, and, and a lot of times work really hard to produce good deer. Um, it, they, it, they just don't grow, uh, um, under rocks and, you know, or grow on trees, I guess they do a little bit grow on trees, but maybe not the best analogy, but producing, ultimately producing, uh, good deer takes work. And so, um, yeah, we've, we've all got to play our part there. Um, and really you go, we've got to make sure that our goals align with our reality. You know, if, uh, if you've got 30 acres of timber in a, in, in an ocean of corn pivots, it's not it's going to be a long shot to try to produce a Boone and Crockett deer in, in country like that. Um, it, you know, really it, it's just like real estate. It, it's location, location, location. You got to have good surrounding habitat around you. And a lot of times neighbors that agree on, you know, have the same goals. Um, and so, yeah, in all that, talk to your neighbors, uh, try to build a, you know, agreement on what you're going to work together, working towards. Um, and if, if you don't have, have the, uh, if, if your reality just isn't going to line up to, you know, mat, make those things match, it, it, it may be tough. So you got to recognize that. I mean, the biggest thing is remember deer hunting is supposed to be fun. This is a, it, it, you know, I, there's nothing much I'd much rather do than be sitting up in a tree um, chasing deer. So um, yeah, remember that it's supposed to be fun. We're, with that, we're going to move on to elk. And so with our elk, we've had increasing populations since the 1980s. Um, they're very charismatic species. There's not much that gets people more excited um, than seeing a group of elk. Um, and they're mostly met with enthusiasm, you know, for landowners, new landowners seeing elk pop over the hill. They love seeing, you know, it's it's pretty special to see, you know, five or eight elk uh, come over the hill. It's when it tends to be 30 or 40 that come over the hill that uh, that maybe they aren't met with that enthusiasm. Um, elk can cause damage, um, especially in that corn and elk interface, you know, out west where we've got uh, corn pivots that are, you know, within a walking range of, of, of where elk are. Um, and I'll 
get into that what the walking range of an elk is but they these you, as you can see um it's you know as well as beans that elk can do a lot of damage in these areas um with that these last few years we've uh uh seen some permit increases historically we've always had some pretty conservative quotas we've gradually increased our elk um until recently um, harvest, we've seen a similar pattern, a little bit of annual variation up and down. Overall, we've had 77% on uh, success on our bull permits historically, which is pretty incredible. Um, and even these last few years when we've ramped permits up, we've maintained that success. Our antlerless uh, success overall historically has been about a little over 40%, which is remarkably good compared to uh, cow permits in Western states. Um, and again, we're, we're currently trying to reduce our uh, elk numbers, if you can't see by those those graphs there, that the, we've increased uh, permits and harvest um, significantly the last few years, kind of in an elk reduction uh, phase right now, um, just due to depredation issues that have, that have arisen here in the last few years. Um, a few of the, one of the major changes that we had this past year is we reorganized our elk management units. We went from the seven really big units, uh, Box Elder was about 26,000 square miles, um, which is about a third of the state of Nebraska. Um, and we just, we, we realized that we were really struggling to get harvest um, outside of our core, core areas. We would, people really good at hunting in these areas. Um, what was hard was to get somebody to, uh, to go chase a, uh, go chase a handful of elk causing problems out in uh, cornfields, whether it was, you know, in, in uh, Perkins and Keith County or even, you know, in Box Butte County, it was it was hard to get people to go uh, go chase elk in some of those areas. So we did separate a lot of these units so that when people get um, permits in, say, units uh, eight or 10 or or even 12, um, they kind of know what they're getting into when they're applying for those areas. Um, and it's, we'll get into some of the results here. Uh, we did, with that restructuring, we did increase our analyst permits by 29%, bull permits by 13%. Um, as of right now, we've had, uh, or the other day, we're at 225 antlers, um harvests compared to 215 a year ago. Uh, early success on those permits was 47%, uh, or those, those early cow elk permits were 47%. On bulls, we're at uh, 205, uh, 21 of those were in peripheral units. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, 33 of the, the antlers harvests were in, uh, peripheral units as well. So we were up over, over 50 where last year we had, uh, it was less than 30. So we've almost doubled our, uh, our, our elk harvest in those peripheral areas with just shifting that around. Um, right now our bull permit success was 81%. Um, and we, we did harvest, uh, quite a few more bulls, uh, this year and a lot of those were in those peripheral areas um and some of those there is that's what was causing problems was some of those wandering bulls in those those uh agricultural areas um you can see real quick those success rates um so far uh bull success in a lot of those you know our, our historical primary units one through six were all really really quite good those peripheral units some of them uh even unit 12 harvest was or our, our bull success was was good. Um, some of them were, but we, we expect our success to be, be lower in those peripheral areas. Um, so moving on, looking ahead, uh, we'll evaluate the season in the coming weeks as our season starts to wrap up. Um, our populations are headed in the right direction, you know, largely due to our landowners. Um, they've done a great job at cooperating and allowing hunters access to get in there and, and, and take elk. Um, done a done a great job with that just uh realizing the, the role that they play in in uh helping reduce those elk numbers um yeah we'll look at our uh, uh as, as part of um evaluating the season we'll look at the bull quality metrics uh and adjust permits there to maintain you know a decent quality uh bull harvest in in the, especially those those uh first six or seven um or units one through six um, and then we'll also look at a few corrections to some unit boundaries um, that have that have popped up with that reorganization. We know there's a few roads, there are a few few lines that need to be moved a little bit to just um, fine tune some of that. Um, and we'll have some landowner's own uh, additions. Um, we do have some elk research going on. Uh, it's been going. We're two years in now. We've collared uh, 120 uh, total elk. We're currently right now. We've got 23. Actually, this is a little bit old. This is a few weeks ago. We've had a few more cows harvested. 
Um, but we had, we were at about 23 bulls and 62 cows. Uh, we started 2023 with 33 bulls and 78 cows collared. Uh, overall, this, our annual survival for 23 for our bulls was 70% uh, cow survival was 79%. Um, hunting accounted for 62% of our mortality. Um, Non-hunting mortality accounted for uh, 10 and 7% for bulls and cows respectively, which is uh, really about what we expected. Um, and hunting accounting for 62% of our mortality is um, what we would expect for a, a population that's in a, uh, a population uh, reduction mode. Um, so that's, everything's kind of uh, been most of what we expected there. Uh, or telling us that we're on the right, especially that we're on the right track with, with those, uh, um, those mortality rates um, with our, our hunting harvest. Um, our home ranges with that did vary quite a bit seasonally and by sex. Um, the, the seasonal ranges were 20 to 81 square kilometers. 46% um, of our elk had separate seasonal ranges, which averaged 15 kilometers apart. So they were uh, moving, you know, nine to 10 miles um, between seasonal ranges. And what we've really learned is that elk cover a lot of ground. Um, this is the months of September and October for the, the elk up in the Pine Ridge. Um, you can see some of them, you know, spent a fair amount of time down, uh, you know, in the, the, the Hemingford to Alliance area. We had one cow wander over into Wyoming and come back. Um, some of our elk are spending a fair amount of time up in, up in South Dakota. They, they bounce around a lot, cover a lot of ground. Um, you can see these, this is a map. It's a little bit confusing here, but you can see all of those polygons are, are different seasonal home ranges. Um, the red are the fall, the green is the, uh, the calving spring and summer, and then, uh, blue is the, the winter. So you can see where elk spent a, a lot of different times of the year there. Um, these are our elk in the, the sand hills and our, our unit unit six, uh, which west there west of Valentine. Um, a lot of our elk in the sand hills are moving all over the place. We've got several elk that have spent a considerable amount of time up in South Dakota. We've had some elk that we collared and uh, within a few days went to South Dakota and then never came back. Um, we, we suspect so, here several years ago, South Dakota was also in a population reduction phase where they were shooting a lot of elk. Um, up, up there in the the, the martin um area in south central uh south dakota we think a lot of our elk probably came from south dakota and the, as many of our elk as have gone back it's we're probably uh correct with that assumption um but we do freely exchange elk um back and forth you know with rosebud indian reservation and and all that we know there's elk moving across there those 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 habitats aren't terribly far apart um, moving on to pronghorn. Um, so our season results, our farm success rates have declined down to 59%. Our goal that we'd like to see is uh, 65 to 80% is where we'd like to be. Um, our yearling buck uh, harvest has gone up. We're about 15% yearling bucks. Recently, we've been around 10. Um, and our archery harvest, our archery success was down to 11% this year. It's been as high as about 19%, but historically that's 10 to 15% is about where that, that tends to fall. Um, overall, our trend, our harvest in, and uh, permits had increased in recent years due to depredation issues. We're definitely trending back down. Our, our pronghorn populations are, are are down. We did do our, our we're able to fly our survey this uh, this past year. Our populations were generally steady in the northern units um, from the 2021 survey. Um, we got to dig into that a little bit more, but I, I know that a lot of our it appears that a lot of our southern um, units are, are are probably down from where they were you know, four or five years ago. Um, yeah, population's generally down. Um, we did have a pretty significant EHD event in 2021. I'll get into some of the details on that here in a bit. Um, but we're likely looking at uh, some decreases in permits again, um, just kind of coming back down from, from some of the highs that where we were at. Um, again, we do collect some of that the that classification data, the those uh, um, herd metrics, you know, our does or our fawns per doe and uh, bucks per doe. Uh, those age and sex ratios of production uh, ratio. Um, our fawn production, you know, has been quite low the last, or at least four out of the last five years um, or that we've that we've surveyed. We didn't get any data in 2020, um, but you can see our, our fawn production is was low. Our, our uh, buck to doe ratio is is down a bit from what it's historically been these last few years, which is probably a, a, an indication that we've been harvesting too many bucks or that our buck harvest has been just a little bit high. Um, in that regard. 
So those are all things that, that we're looking at. Um, we'll go into the pronghorn research project that wrapped up about a year ago. We did capture 110 uh, pronghorn through that project. Um, they were affixed with, they've given GPS collars that had two and a half hour fix rates. Um, the collars had a, a life of about two years, uh, which uh, accumulated about 2.6 million uh, GPS locations uh, that looks like that with locations stacked on top of each other. Um, that's where mo most of our uh, effort was uh, around the periphery, the, the west and southwest periphery of the Sand Hills, and then uh, the southern panhandle in that Banner South unit, uh, just to look at some movements and survival um, of those, those pronghorn. Um, so our, our overall, our uh, survival estimate was 65%. We had 61% in year one and 69% in year two. Year one was 2021. That was when we had an EHD event. Um, out west, we we lost probably fifteen to twenty percent of our antelope our callers uh, at that time, um, just due to that EHD event. It was a pretty major thing going on. Um, at the same time, that same year, South Dakota observed survival rates of seventy four to ninety five percent. Um, so our our survival was uh, significantly lower than what our our neighboring state uh, saw um, over that same time period. Um, we did have 58 mortalities over the course of that project. Um, so with that, you know, 35 of those were, were male, and that uh, meant that we had a 53% survival, annual survival for our, our, our bucks, um, which is really quite low. The 75% survival on our, our does um, was uh, somewhat low, although I would say we were in a population reduction mode at that at that point, too. So seeing 75 isn't a, a huge shock. Um, if in a normal hunting scenario that that would have been somewhere in that 85 to 90 percent survival um so yeah hunter harvest was a, a, a large part of it uh 16 of them uh 11 were ehd a couple poaching uh there were 25 unknown um looking at the timing of of those there's probably eight of those that were you know the effect of winter and they, they're unknown because we just simply can't get to them in time to really determine anything um but probably eight of those were winter related um, you know, that a lot of some of those happened that, you know, late winter, you know, March timeframe when when there's not much left for, for pronghorn to eat at that point. We had another five that that occurred during the, you know, September and early October when the, the, we were having some uh, EHD deaths and we just couldn't get to them in time to to get anything from them. Um, and then there's also some, you know, likely some wounding and some predation that we just didn't pick pick up. And there were four capture related fatalities, but those are you know, censored from the analysis. Um, pronghorn can tend to be uh, rather hard to catch or it's that they're, they're pretty fragile boned. So they, sometimes they don't always handle that real well. Um, overall, I guess one of the things we did look at was habitat selection. Um, pronghorn selected for areas, uh, agricultural areas in winter, spring and fall. Um, they did avoid roads in fall and winter. Um, likely related to the the hard hunting seasons. Uh, they did also avoid water and wetlands as they're crossing the sand hills. Um, one of some of the movement stuff that we found with it is that pronghorn move. Um, some of them go far uh, from Highway 87 uh, north of Alliance to Highway 97 north of Mullen is 96 miles. Um, we had some of these pronghorn went over 100 miles um, from the the eastern part eastern part of the range to the western part of the range. Um, and by and large, they were wintering um, out on the, the crop fields west of the sand hills or on the periphery of the sand hills and then going into the, the sand hills during the, the summer, um, you know, for the, the uh, uh, fawning and, and summer and early fall. A lot of them would tend to come back early November-ish, about November 1st. They'd start coming back in October, but November, October is when they were moving back. Um, some of them do not. This one spent most of its time this is uh from february to october movements um this square here that i'm not tracing very well is one square mile um in that wheat country so this one had a home range of you know only a, a, a couple three square miles um and some of them move seasonally this is almost a, an entire year uh, as you can see moved out there in march spent summer um most the entire summer out there into early fall and then come october moves back so the city of alliance is about right here so this is you know hemingford is up over here um this is the road that goes up to hay springs but yeah spend summers in the sand hills move out spend the winter on the, the crop grounds 
Um, and so they do some of these seasonal movements. This is the month of March, and they don't always do it together at the same time. You can see how some of them, they generally all end up at about the same area, but they didn't do any of that travel together. So uh, a lot of fascinating movements going on with, with these different animals. Um, and some of it's conditionally. This is something that we're, we're trying to ferret out that we're going to try to work through a little bit. Um, but these are the move. These are the locations uh, for a lot of these pronghorn. Um, the last half of December in 2022. Um, these are the locations for them at the same time, uh, the same year in 2021. Um, the difference here is that in 2022, it was the average temperature uh, at for those days was 23 degrees. In 21, the average temperature was 35 degrees. Um, and so it likely there's there's some weather impacts here. When it's cold, they got to go where they've, they've got some uh, more nutritious food. Um, whereas when it's warmer, they may just stay in the sandhills as, as long as they can. Um, but we'll, we're, we're going to continue digging into a, a lot of that data um, to figure some of that stuff out. Um, not sure what, no, that was, I guess that was the end of it. There's supposed to be a slide there that said questions and comments, but yeah. With that, we'll uh, move on to oh, stop share. There we go. All right. I, with that, let me pull up the chat. You guys have been dutifully entering stuff in there, so we'll. Hey, start... Luke, were you were you going to cover any potential changes? Oh yeah, that? I didn't have those slides, did I? That's a good point, Alicia. Um, so, yeah, we've got a, a handful of things that we're looking at for this next year. Um, and I would have been better if I had slides for this. Um, one of the things we're, we're looking at is going to a, a hybrid check station system where we're going to keep our uh, um, we're going to keep our check station, our in-person check stations open. But we're also or we're going to operate those. But we're also going to keep telecheck open uh, to allow people to telecheck their deer during the November firearm or that's what we're proposing to the commission at the December or at the January commission meeting. Um, so that's one of the things we're, we're looking at doing. Um, we, we've realized there, it's a handful of reasons. We've realized that um, there's, it, it's asking hunters to drive, you know, that far is, is a big ask across a, a large and large becoming larger portion of the state. It's been hard to keep a lot of our check stations open. We have about 10% of them um, quit on us each year. And so we're finding new ones in some towns we can't, we've talked to every business in town, you know, there's some, some of our, uh, places like Stapleton and, or, or is Tryon, they're operating out of people's houses at this point. It just people are being nice and generous and doing it for us. Um, you know, and so it's, th there's like eight counties in the state that don't have a check station in it currently. Um, so it's, you know, and, and we're one of the last few states that's, uh, that requires mandatory in-person check. Um, so that's one of the things we're looking at. The other, uh, is the, one of the things that a, a lot of our Western units this year, we did go to, um, with the non-resident caps, we went down to 15%, um, for non-residents, 85% for residents. What we did notice that there was a few of those, um, units that, and, and we have, we have, by statute, um, we have to uh, maintain 85% of those permit allocations for for red to be made available for residents. Um, we did know that, or we've noticed that um, some of those units, either the permits uh, on the resident side sold very slowly um, or didn't sell out at all. Sand Hills and Pine Ridge, I believe, uh, never sold out. Um, so the resident demand is being met. Um, but there's also a huge request from non-residents to, to also hunt those areas, particularly on private land. Um, and so we're looking at um, a, basically creating private land only permits that would um, be just, a, it's the same as a unit permit. It would be just a shift of some of those uh, permit quotas, um, some of those unsold uh, permit quotas over to a permit that's valid for both uh, residents and non-residents to purchase um, and would go on sale at the resident time. And then, uh, uh, would be available for non-residents to purchase and be valid on private land only. Um, the other thing, the other kind of major change that we're looking at too, uh, is with our permit purchasing dates and the application periods, um, just do with the capacities of our new system, um, or the, and, or the lack of capacity with our old system. Um, 
we had to uh, create eight different sales dates for our, our deer and antelope uh, and elk permits during the summer. Um, and that was simply because we could only, you know, have a hand. We, we had to reduce the stress on the system uh, after it crashed in um, 2018 and 2019. Um, that was our solution was to have, you know, a bunch of different sales dates. The new system can handle the traffic. So we're, we're proposing to going to three sales dates in the summer, a, not, or a, a resident day um, there in July. And then two weeks later, the, the non-resident permits go on sale. And then about two weeks after that, or a week to two weeks after that, then all of the, uh, the forfeited draw permits, the, those permits that um, either got returned or couldn't be sold during the, the drop in the, in, as a part of the draw, those will go on sale that the first Wednesday in, in August. And we're actually going to a Wednesday sales date at 10 a.m. Um, instead of the Monday at 1, um, in part to allow staff uh, the the ability to prepare uh, that week for, for some different things, take care of uh, some stuff. And then we're also going at 10 a.m. because our phones were ringing all morning anyway um, for that 1 a.m. start. So we we just felt it would serve everybody better to, to start earlier in the day. Um, the other part that, that we're looking at, um, or a couple of things we're, we're also looking at is the uh, uh, for the the mule deer conservation area name. Um, we're actually looking at kind of moving away from using that name. Um, we're not going away from uh, focusing on mule deer management in the West uh, in the slightest. And in fact, this will help us be more versatile in our our uh, mule deer management. Um, a lot of those. The, the MDCA name is kind of a one size fits all. Um, we found that it doesn't really fit across the, the state. So um, we, we're going to kind of move away from that name, but we're still going to focus on uh, um, managing for mule deer in those, those Western units for sure. Uh, the other thing is um, we're also looking at like our, our unit, um, either sex permits, you know, or our uh, November firearm permits, like the, 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 um, buffalo whitetail, um, either sex permit, buffalo, uh, those types of permits, we're looking at making season choice. So you could hunt during, uh, with, during the archery season with archery equipment, firearm season with firearm equipment, um, or muzzleloader season. Um, that's been a request from a lot of hunters that we've, we've gotten. They would like the versatility of those permits. And, um, you know, it's very similar to what that statewide whitetail buck, um, permit is. We're just going to use the, the move into a season choice format for, um, for a lot of our unit permits. Um, and Alicia, I think that's all of it, right? The changes that we're looking at or the, the, the changes other than just permit quotas and things like that. Yes. I think you've covered most of them. Okay. All right. Let me, you guys have added a lot. Let's see. All right. Matt Bird start out with, I like the season where it is. We'd like to see an additional um, week to the firearm season. Yeah. And that's something we talk about. We, we have that conversation with landowners. Um, most landowners want us to kind of keep it as short as possible. Um, it, you know, it just tends to be a, a bit of chaos across the landscape. And so th that would be something that we would want to, um, discuss with our landowners. Um, Kenneth says one buck per hunter is the reasonable way to increase buck populations. Um, yeah, you, you, we definitely reduce, but it always it, or reduce buck harvest, um, but it, it comes at a cost, um, you know, of, of opportunity. Um, the bounty on coyotes and coons, a uh, question mark from Larry. Uh, well, for one, I don't know that we could actually have a bounty on coyotes because we don't actually, by statute, we don't actually manage coyotes um, in Nebraska. They're, they're not one of the species that's on our list. Um, and really... Bounties, I, I know that's popular because, you know, South Dakota does it. Um, there's really been no evidence that, that bounties actually work on at, um, at increasing, you know, uh, game bird or uh, ground nesting bird populations um, or increasing nest success. Um, to, to, to have an effect of, you know, of predator uh, removal um, to, to or to do enough predator removal to have an effect on, uh, bird nesting success you really have to you have to be trapping there's a lot of research that's shown that you that you have to trap like immediately ahead of the um nesting season and at a very high intensity um 
over a, a very large area, like 10,000 plus acres and one person that's doing nothing but trapping for several weeks ahead of that time. Like it's to the point you've got to have somebody that's doing a full-time job. Um, otherwise, if it's just a small area, um, predators move in um, in a very short amount of time. It's it's hard to have a, a um, an effect especially a population at a statewide level, a population level effect to the point where you would actually uh, influence um, ground nesting uh, bird success. Um, but yeah, so let's see, Brad says, Hamilton County area hunt, the cotton queen population increase, southern cuts two days. Um, well, the, the, right now there's not really anybody stop. There's nothing stopping people from hunting coyotes. There's virtually no rules to hunting coyotes. I, I think if you, and the, the somewhat tongue-in-cheek example I have used in the past is if you've got an M1 Abr got an Abrams tank, um, I think you could hunt coyotes with it. Um, there's not a lot stopping stopping people. So if 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 you got coyotes in your area, get out there and and get after it. There's there's really nothing stopping you now. And I guess on the the coyote side, even if we could offer a bounty, you know, coyotes were worth a, somewhere around a hundred dollars in the early '80s, and you convert that to today, and that's about three hundred dollars in value. And there were coyotes year after year after year in the eighties, we shot a lot of coyotes and we didn't really seem to knock the population back. I, I, I believe most of a, a good portion of my college was paid for by my dad shooting coyotes um, through that time. And it, th it sure didn't seem to lessen coyote populations and even raccoon largely driven by disease coyotes. You know, we typically get mange um, and, and raccoons, you know, distemper events tend to be what, what drives that. But, my point with the price is there. I, I don't know what how much we would have to put a bounty on a coyote if it had maybe three hundred dollars or more to actually, you know, or five hundred dollars a piece to to have a population uh, level effect, and that would be the the cost of that would be astronomical. Um, Ten dollars wouldn't do it. Um, wouldn't wouldn't get enough out there, and really that that's still a, a lot of money. Um, I mean, South Dakota pays. Five hundred thousand dollars a year to to harvest essentially fifty thousand raccoons. Um, when we were at our peak, and we still years like now when coyotes or raccoons aren't worth anything, we we're, we're harvesting our we're trapping about fifty thousand. Ten years ago, when they were worth a little money, we were trapping two hundred fifty thousand raccoons every year, and year after year after year. So it, the the numbers to have a population level effect would have to be like probably twice as many as that. Um. So Ryan. Yeah, I've got a lot of questions here, so I'm, I'm going to have to try to work through these quickly for you. I'll try to get to as many of them as or I'll, I'll try to get through all of them for you. all um, Ryan says, I think it'd be uh, as comparing to Kansas, for example, hunters and deer habitat acres are very similar. Kansas has twice the deer, twice the hunters, twice the habitat. So in theory, um, Kansas, they don't have twice the number of, of, of hunters that, that we do. They've got... Um, it's it's not even half again more. They shoot about forty thousand bucks a year. Where we shoot in past years, we've been shooting about thirty thousand. Um, but they've got the habitat is just different. And again, it's the mentality is different. Um, but yeah, also thinks we should cut that that second buck permit. And it's it's something definitely to consider. Appreciate the the comment. Um. Oh, I get a. So there's a few of them that come straight to me. Um, let's see, I'm going to. Somebody asking about uh, mountain lions and what we're looking at doing um, with with mountain lions in the Pine Ridge. Sam, would you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, I can read you the question. But it's just they said they hunt the, the Pine Ridge area outside of Harrison. Um, they've seen an increase in lions. I'm just asking what we're uh, what we're what what's our plan to address the increase in the lion population? Sure. So yeah, we we do we have had harvest seasons in the Pine Ridge going back to 2014. We conduct genetic surveys there in the Pine Ridge to try to get an idea of population levels, and then we also track uh, known mortalities for mountain lions. So. Uh, mountain lions that die outside of the harvest season. We also take that into account and we look at numbers each year. We were just out at some big game meetings out. Uh, we held one in Crawford, which is right there in the Pine Ridge. 
uh, to get some input from people out there. And generally people uh, are obviously concerned about deer numbers out there and they would like uh, mountain lion harvest increased. And so we're gonna look at our numbers and make, you know, kind of, I guess, see what we think the population can uh, withstand for harvest. And so we're taking social tolerance into account, but they are a game animal, so we're not going to go down to zero. Uh, so that so it's going to be some balance of increasing harvest pressure to try to get a response. Uh, and I know some landowners have mentioned that they are seeing seeing more lands out there, and we should have a new population estimate in maybe the next couple months. Okay, thanks, Sam. Yep. Um, Matt has a comment, non-resident landowner deer permit cost is too high. Um, that's actually set in statute um, by our legislature. And I guess, uh, you know, there, there's some states like Iowa where non-residents aren't eligible for landowner permits. Um, you know, so there's, uh, I guess I'm saying it could, it could always be worse, uh, but I, I do appreciate the, the, the comment and the input there. Um, uh, Ron sent a, a comment directly to me. It says, uh, seeing no changes to the approach here. Um, turkey number is worse than I've seen in years. Same with deer, non-resident with 40 acres. Been hoping for years that something would change with the management. Super disappointing to see the status quo and no adjustments to address the sad situation. Um, I, I didn't go through what we're, we, we haven't decided what we're doing for permit quotas and such um, next year. I expect that we'll reduce. Um, like I said, we, we reduced our, um, both our antlerless only and our buck permit uh, quotas this past year. I assume we'll, it's, I can almost guarantee we'll be, we'll sell fewer permits for next year. Um, so it's not that we're not doing anything. Um, just, we haven't got to, to got through everything yet. Um, Dan says, if you cut to two buck tags and 1.5% increase uh, improves exponentially over several years. Um, it it really like the the difference there though it it doesn't increase a whole lot i it's not necessarily exponential because the the bucks aren't producing any more does or the the bucks aren't producing more deer so it's just 1.5% um there and that's the, the the amount of variability there i mean with ehd that could be wiped out very quickly in a, a year of ehd like what we've seen um the, the point there that I'm making is that the, the overall increase annually is, is, is very minimal. Um, Don says, what about game parks holding tournaments with prizes to help generate more predator control? Um, uh, so many coyotes, great way to help your population rebound. Uh, you know, that, that's also up to the public. I mean, the public can um, do that as well. And there's a, a number of places that are putting those on. I don't know that, uh, I'm not sure we can, we could do that. I, I, I really don't know. Um, but it's, yeah, I appreciate the comment there. Um, Brad says land available to hunt for the average shows decrease for many reasons. I understand, but the increase of properties owned by, or leased by outfitters have driven more hunters to public land, which I feel has hit deer numbers really hard. Um, in some areas, can anything be done before most lands are lost unless you pay a huge fee? Um, we, you know, our, our, uh, open fields and waters program. We try to, we, we've grown that um, greatly these last few years. I don't know that there's really a whole lot that we can do to, to influence the, um, the, the economics of, of hunters leasing lands. I mean, the only way I, I mentioned this at our meeting the other night, the only way that that would stop is if all hunters got together and just agreed not to lease lands, um, which isn't realistic. Um, but we're, we're working on that. We're trying to, you know, we put a lot of money into our, our public areas. Um, our, our WMAs, you know, are, are pretty heavily managed um, every year and trying to make them better for wildlife, you know, as well as that OFW program. But yeah, it's it, access is always a concern for for deer hunting, for sure. Um, Joseph says, uh, will this presentation be available online, including the chat questions? Um, the chat questions, I don't know that they will get, um, is, they'll, they'll be available as, as I'm reading them. Um, this video uh, we'll get uploaded to YouTube here at some point. Um, so this we'll, we'll end up using this version. The one I did in December, my presentation, I, something went goofy with it. And um, so we're going to use this one. Um, but yeah, it, it'll get, it'll get posted there. And I'm, like I said, I'm trying to read all these questions. So they will be, um, I guess, available that way. Uh, Ryan says, why not do a youth week instead of early special landowner season? Um, we're landowners and think it's not needed. Promoting youth is, youth is way more important. 
Um, yeah, youth is uh, yeah, definitely good. The, the special landowner season is actually uh, put into place by statute um, through the legislature. Um, we as an agency don't really have a whole lot of control over that um, season. Um, and there, there is the opportunity for that season to be kind of used to, you know, there's a, there's six, each landowner can get six, you, you know, permits for, for people 18 and under, um, for that season. So it's, I, I think some of their intent was to try to make that available for a lot of, a, a, a lot of youth, um, in that regard. And so it'd be up to the, yeah, it up to the landowners to, to use it that way, um, or as they see fit. But yeah, and it looks like Aaron kind of said the same thing. Um, yeah, I'm not going to read through all the back and forth there. Um, let's see. Greg says, wish there's a better way to find a place for my grandkids to hunt than registering on the antlerless website. Um, yeah, the, the antlerless uh, hunter database isn't necessarily a, a the, the purpose of that is not to for to necessarily help people find a place to hunt. Um, it's more of a landowner tool to make sure that which is it's when we work with landowners that's, you know, in. in when they have too many deer, a, a common comment that we've gotten from them is, well, I don't know anybody that um, wants to hunt antlerless deer, but just wants to shoot bucks. And so our staff will print that list off um, and have it in their pocket so that when they get that comment, they can actually hand a, a, a list of hunters ready uh, and available um, to hunt antlerless deer um, where that, that land, landowner is at. Um, it gets used a, a, a pretty fair amount. We've had landowners kick off their hunters in favor of uh um people on that list in the past it doesn't it you know that's not always the outcome but it, it does happen it does get used um not as much as everybody would hope uh but you know there's there's some of that so and i Alicia well, talked about the that path program um let's see todd says there any work done to get the work site word website working better uh even a little Lady at the low, sorry, my tongue is getting twist. Let me get a drink. Is any work being done to get the website working better? Even the lady at the local office has trouble uh, getting to things. Yeah, it's, that's a part of it. The, the first year of any uh, major software uh, like that, there's always a learning curve. Um, Some of the issues that's, that have popped up have just, have been difficult to uh foresee um it's it's definitely getting better it, it is i can tell you it's a much better backbone um than what our previous system was you know i, I mentioned the, the the old system the crashing issues that we had it couldn't handle the the traffic load um you know some of it is is simply the learning curve and just learning how to to use it that you know new things are always a little a little harder um but in time we'll, we'll get used to it the other the other system we had had for 14 years, I think, and everybody was really used to it, but it, it was that, that software was, was slowly dying on us. So we, we needed to move on. Um, but yeah, we're, it's continually, it, it'll next year will be better than this. I can guarantee. So, um, so I think, uh, Alicia answered that question on from Todd, how are the dollars that are collected through the game and parks divided up between hunting, uh, water and parks? Um, each of it goes to each of the the specific areas. Um, yeah, park park fees go to parks, wildlife fees go to wildlife, and same with fish. Um, we all fund our own our own. So, um, so Ryan asked, "What is Game Park's goal with having elk units in Eastern Nebraska, specifically Area 15?" Yeah, I didn't dive into how Area 15 operated um, in my presentation there. I was trying to move through it quickly, but Area 15, um, we didn't allocate any permits for for Unit 15. Um, in part because we, there's usually elk in that unit, but we we didn't want to sell permits and then have a fall when somebody's like, hey, I finally got my permit. Where do I go? And then we're, we're like, we don't even know where any elk are in unit 15. So the way we organized um, unit 15 is we included the unit 15 boundary in the descriptions for every other unit. Um, so all of the permits issued for uh, units one through 14 are also valid in 15. And we did that um, also in part because we know a large percentage of our hunters are coming from Eastern Nebraska and may know um, somebody, or if somebody in Eastern Nebraska has ends up with an elk on trail camera or an elk in their uh, field or in their, um, in and around their, 
cattle like you know commonly occurs there's pretty good chance they're going to know somebody that's got an elk permit um that year or it's not too hard to find somebody that's got an elk permit um and so those permits would also be valid in, in unit 15 and we did have one bull harvested um in unit 15 up in stanton county uh this year pretty big bull um so that's we we don't we found that you know as we get more into some of the agricultural part of the states the row crop the tolerance for elk goes down um really quickly uh we just really don't have the space to support herds of elk in in eastern nebraska um unfortunately it, it just it it's i i don't know that we'll ever see uh um, sustained herds in the, the eastern part of the state like we do in the western part it's just it's just functions differently um we, we've got a number of well like what we've seen in the last few years we've, we've run into the the agricultural and damage issues out west where we have you know less than a quarter of the landscape is in row crop um i don't know it, it just wouldn't work in an, an area where it's 80 and 90 percent row crop um with elk unfortunately um larry says why are we shooting fawns and does in late season when the population is down um some of it is i, I would say to, to answer that is that going to zero harvest isn't a, a um really a great option for managing deer you know even areas you know there's there's probably some areas where zero harvest would be good um when, when deer populations are just normal production they can double about every three to four years um and so just turning it off completely uh we would be you know have depredation issues really quickly and and it would be hard to turn that harvest back on as quick as we can it's kind of one of those things we'd rather um you know turn the dial up or, or down slowly on and you know i guess a, a hockey shaped a hockey stick shaped graph for a, a deer population is never a good thing, um, either up or down. Um, and so, especially if something starts coming up way too fast, that, that's when we would get ourselves into trouble on the other side of it, especially with whitetails. Whitetails can recover quite quickly. And so, and that's something um, we'll, we'll work to adjust is adjusting our antlerless harvest over the next, uh, over this year and, you know, the coming years. We, we look at the, all of those permits um, every year. Um, and adjust the, the the permit quotas, the bag limits, some of the unit boundaries we look at just to try to fine tune our, our, our doe harvest. I know, you know, a lot of our, I didn't really get into it, kind of hustled through it, but, you know, a lot of the issues with our, our, our deer population where we're at right now, about five years ago, we were asked to reduce our, our deer numbers. Um, and so we, we responded with increasing our doe permits, but it, uh, shortly following that, we entered into, you know, kind of a multi-year drought across several different parts of the state. Um, which, you know, impacted another, a, a number of things, you know, fawn survival, even uh, adult survival, you know, we had EHD events. Uh, I think the Northeast part of the state has been hit with EHD three years in a row. Um, and so some of that we couldn't throw where we couldn't throw on the brakes quick enough. And some of that we just couldn't predict um, with, with all of it. And so we'll, we'll go through, we'll adjust uh, antlerless harvest because that's really the, the driving factor with our populations. What we've got most control over is, is how many does and that we're, that we're harvesting. Um, and so that's, that's, yeah, that's a lot of what we'll, what we're facing and, and we'll be looking at. And I'm sure we'll, we'll look at, you know, some of the, the season lengths and, and, and things like that, you know, cause we did expand that river antlerless season. Uh, to the full month of January here a few years ago. Um, so that's something we could easily ratchet down a bit. So we'll, we'll definitely look at it. Um, Lonnie has the comment, I have two outfitters that hunt within a mile of my land. Yeah, it's become uh, increasingly popular. Let's see, David says, uh, very interesting information. Thanks for the pronghorn movements or information about the pronghorn movements. Thanks, yeah, thanks, David. Uh, Jared asks, what about digital deer tags like NGB, NGPC does with turkey permits? That's actually something we're looking at. The new system is capable of handling that. Um, we want to, before we look at doing it for deer, we want to make sure that the, the, we've got all the bugs worked out of the turkey side of it. So, um, that's something that could show up on the horizon, um, in the next few years. I don't think, I don't know that it would be in the next year or two, but that's, it, it, likely on the horizon as long as everything goes uh like we like we hoped um uh 
Uh, let's see. Hey, Luke. Wanna... Yeah, go ahead. Did you get Did you get up to the top of the questions? I feel like you maybe have missed some of those. Did I? I thought it felt like I had gotten through these really fast. Did I miss a bunch? I don't. Maybe I didn't hear you because I was trying to answer some too. But did you get the one like from Greg Anderson? Would you would like to see the end of all bonus antlerless tags on every unit and no antlerless firearm tags for public land? I'm not even seeing that. It's at the well, it's the top of mine. What's the timestamp on it? Um 7 13 p.m. Oh, there's a few more messages. I only went up to 729. So That's... there's 709 is where it starts. Okay. That would make sense. Why I oh yeah. I'm way behind. All right. Sorry. <laughs> no, good catch because it, it didn't. I scrolled all the way to the top and it didn't pop up. So I'll start over. And when I start repeating, I'll have to skip back down. So but I, um, I tried to catch a few of them. So maybe you can just read those real quick and move on. OK. Uh, Craig says, curious about future plans for the Republican unit, in particular Webster County. Whitetail numbers are seriously declining. Uh, concerned about analyst doe tags for residents and non-residents. Yep, that's something we'll look at, Craig. Um, some of those areas, you know, and not only Webster County, but, you know, farther west, you know, the, the upper Republican has definitely been declining. And we, we reduced permits in the Republican this this past year to the first for the first time in a, a long while. Um, and so we, we did reduce uh, overall harvest um, there. But it's it's like I said, it's something we'll definitely look at. Uh, David says, I like to hunt, shoot and field dress deer for meat donations. Analyst is just fine. Is there a way to try to offer my services to more people than registering on the uh, Game Parks website? Um, some of it's just making those connections, um, but yeah, or just finding people, not necessarily having you sign up, but you can just find people on that, the, the deer exchange there. Um, or if you want to do the uh, um, hunters helping the hungry at the local processor. Um, uh, Greg, uh, would like to see the end of all bonus antlers tags in every unit and no antlers firearm tags for public land. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Well, I, I don't know that we'll go quite that far but we like i said we do look at all of our permits um i suspect that we, we last year we did take a lot of bonus tags off um obviously we didn't take them all off there's still space for us to 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 reduce um that and there's there's a number of the our, our public lands where we've already made those those public land restrictions so yeah it's something we'll look at greg thanks um kenneth says seems reasonable to go to one uh bird until population increases oh i, I assume that means on turkeys um yeah, you know, the the thing with that, though, is we're still, um, you know, our our turkey population index is is still higher than we were at any time prior to about 2006 or 2005. Um, and we went to three birds in like 2008 or nine, um, you know, and so it really it's, the, you know, we got got our total permit sales down to about where we proportionally where we wanted it to. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's definitely something to consider. Um, make sure, yeah. So let's see. Tom says, uh, "Is there plans to make changes for out-of-state tags for mule deer in the Sand Hills uh, unit for 24? Also, any changes for whitetail tags in the Sand Hills units for 24? Um, we haven't uh, really adjusted those." Uh, uh, or made any of those recommendations yet i will we'll look at that harvest data we don't have any plans um just yet that'll all get published uh, towards the end of march um ahead of our april commission meeting um but uh, i and like i like i did mention we'll, we'll probably have some sort of private land only permit to make a few more of those available um for non-residents on, on private land um in the sand hills um so Let's see. Kenneth says, I own a thousand acres of Republican River Bottom by Colbertson, which is in the Frenchman unit. Oh, OK. Yep, we've seen we've seen whitetail numbers out there decrease as well as our, our bird numbers uh, for sure. Uh, Joseph says, when does the three year turkey study end? Any changes expected prior to the end of the study, uh, especially related to the opening shotgun? Uh, opening date of shotgun season. Yeah, that's something we'll look at with that goblin chronology. I think that Alicia mentions there. So yeah, we, we want to wait till we've got good good information before we we uh, make decisions on that. 
Um, oh, that's, yeah, it kind of shuffles in some odd orders, but the, yeah, the deer numbers are way down while you're still letting out so many doe tags. Um, but yeah, out there, that's something we'll definitely look at. The, 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 the Frenchman was, it was kind of a, the Frenchman was a tough case, um, for us following 2012 EHD event. Um, our whitetails didn't seem to be impacted at all. And so we tried to keep pressure on them. The mule deer numbers, as everybody know, did fantastic for a number of years. And then, um, when we started increasing harvest, you know, we did have drought and just a number of things that impacted, uh, all of that. And like I say, some of those areas, we just couldn't turn the, the doe harvest off fast enough. Um, we thought, you know, we felt like we were reducing, um, in ways that we needed to, and we just, we didn't seem to, to be able to catch up in, in, in some of those areas, but yeah, I, I totally get your concern there, Kenneth. Um, all right. I think I'm caught up, Alicia, on questions. Oh man. What in the world? I think when people comment on them, it changes the order. It moves them to the bottom. It does some weird stuff because one of these I know I've already. Oh, wait, no, that was from Chris. That was the one I got. Never mind. I'll, I'll move over to that one. We've already addressed it from about the lions in the Pine Ridge. Um, Yeah, Todd asks, can changes be made to allow only one buck for hunter? Um, It's definitely something to consider. Like I said, that's something that's that's really got to come from our, our hunters. Um, uh, Aaron says, Luke, I didn't have my, or my kids, uh, mule deer age at check-in, but can you add, oh, add those to our numbers. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I'll be able to do that, but no, I, I appreciate the input there. You guys did well. Um, Jared says, we uh, would like to see a bounty program for predators like South Dakota successfully, uh, would benefit the turkeys tremendously and put less pressure on fawns. Um, I guess that, you, I already kind of covered some of that. The the one thing with like South Dakota specifically, they, they actually haven't seen an increase in their um, their turkeys or their pheasant um, production in, in the years uh, that they've run the program. In fact, the first year they did it, um, they actually saw a seventeen percent decrease in their brood their pheasant brood survey, um, at which the that year their commission voted to quit collecting their their pheasant brood survey. So they no no longer collect any of the information um on their uh th their pheasant brood their pheasant production on the turkey side uh 2023 was the first year they've seen an increase in their brood production um in like the last six or seven years they've they've their production has been quite poor and i've talked with their turkey biologist i know him quite well and he said it was it was strictly because they had good moisture and a, a good nesting year um for just good cover um in, in, in all that that was why they're they, they just had different weather pattern this year that, that influenced that um matt asked why does a non-resident landowner have to own 320 acres to apply for one deer permit uh can this be lowered to a similar to neighboring states maybe 100 or 60 to 100 acres uh well our residents have to have 80 um to qualify and we've got you know in statute they, they set it up we, we've got to maintain preference for resident um resident hunters uh so in that you know that it just has to be you know more difficult for for non-residents to qualify whether it's landowner or general permits um so it's that that's set in statute that's not something that we necessarily have control over um nor would we necessarily want to uh i don't know that it's something that we would want to motivate non-residents to buy more land um in nebraska that would be a uh that there could be some issues that come along with that um, Larry says, I think the predators are affecting all populations. Um, Don says, agree, all my cameras have coyotes every night. No need to move the season. Just limit it to one buck per hunter per year per hunter, at least for a few years. Um, uh, Matt says, please do not entertain any wolf introductions. And Alicia, yeah, not something we're looking at. Um, Uh, Ryan says, uh, part of why those states have better trophy qualities do the State Department uh, on board with managing deer to promote quality instead of uh, hunter quantity. Um, I would actually argue that a bit. Their biologists, they don't do any, like their, um, their state management 
both Kansas or Iowa don't have anything in place that would promote necessarily promote um, increased quality. They essentially have they functionally have unlimited buck tags in, in Iowa. Their buck tags are valid statewide with no limit. Um, in Kansas, there's there's no limit for residents. Iowa has no limit for for residents um, either. Uh, they both have uh, caps on non-resident permits. Uh, Kansas uh, issues twice as many um, non-resident buck permits as we do. Um, really, it, it comes down to a, a, a cultural thing there that, that's implemented by the hunters. The, the, the state agencies do very little um, on the, the, the quality uh, management end um, of that. I, I, I know they're biologists and, and states across the East, very, very few states do anything um, quality wise. Um, so, but yeah, I, I appreciate the comment. Uh, let's see. Okay. I think I'm caught up. Yeah. I'm caught up now so I can scroll down. And... Sorry, this is taking me a little bit. I want to make sure I don't miss. Uh, let's see. Oh, I think Alessia addressed the question about limiting the number of non-resident um, hunters. Yeah, we did actually cap that at 10,000 this last year. So that's, uh, um, that was a new thing uh, this past year. Um, it was capped at 15,000 year the previous year. And then that the cap of 10,000 um, is basically where we were from 2014 to 2018. Um, that average. So it wasn't um, terribly long ago that, you know, we, we just saw a pretty drastic increase from, from 2019 to 2021. 20, uh, um, COVID played a part of that. And we realized that um, we, we really, we were too high at that point and needed to reduce back to kind of where we were. Um, Chris commented, uh, coming from a state that switched to online uh, check-in, being from a law enforcement career, I can tell you that when the check stations go away, who so does compliance with checking laws? Um, yes and no. Our, our law enforcement has actually been in favor. They, the, um, the guys that are, that are breaking the law, I'm trying to think of how to say it, they're, they're doing it whether they have to check, take it to a check station or not. Um, we found that we get better data and, and most of our check stations, um, are manned by gas station attendants that aren't going to catch law enforcement issues. Our, our check stations aren't meant to enforce laws. Um, so there's a, um, there's a few things that go along with that. Uh, John asks, any talk of reducing or eliminating late season antlers, uh, seasons with the declining population? Um, well, that's something we'll consider. We talk about those season lengths all the time. I think I mentioned that already. Um, it is something we'll look at and consider. Um, yeah, Larry says, uh, the new site is very user unfriendly and Aaron said, I said the same thing, but after using it more, I can honestly say it's a much better system. And it, it is, it's just, it, um, yeah, it, there's a little bit of a learning curve. It just takes a little bit of time to figure out where, where things are. Um, and, and there's, there's things that we need to improve. I'll, I'll fully admit that it's not a perfect system at this point. We're still working through some of that stuff. Um, but it, it, where it, like I said, the overall backbone is much better system. Um, it'll get more user friendly over time, and it'll it'll always get better as we as everybody gets a little more familiar with it. Um, Ryan says, if you go with the season choice permits, it aligns even more with a one buck limit. Thanks for that. Uh, Todd says, do you have a way to add deer that are harvested legally, but people don't or won't drive however far to check in to harvest numbers? I guess. Todd, do you want to clarify that? I'm not quite following on that. If you want to unmute, Todd, your comment, you're asking about adding deer that are harvested legally. If we still got Todd here. Oh my, I think that maybe the answer to that is just, we'll, we'll, it'll, they'll be allowed to telecheck deer. Um, if what we're proposing um, passes, so then people won't have to drive. You'll be able to check it in with your phone right where you kill it. So um, Adam says, happy to hear nunners and hunters uh, may be able to get tags for private land only hunting. Okay, good deal. Uh, Tom says, why is the deer population decline so much in Southwest Nebraska? 
Uh, you read Willow County declined as much in the last uh, three to four years. Uh, the big thing for the Southwest, I think, is drought. You guys got crushed by the drought. Uh, there, fawn production down there tanked. Both whitetails and mule deer were were pretty poor these last few years. Um, the that drought was really hard on stuff, and it came at a time, you know, when we had increased permits. Um, but man, there 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 wasn't a whole lot left on the landscape uh, during that drought. You know, you fawn there there was not much cover for for fawns to hide in. Um, I think that's the the drought has played a large part of that these last few years out there. Fortunately, you guys were able to get some rain this year. Um, so that's uh, good news. Hopefully we can come out of it and, and recover. Uh, Robert asks, where's the current uh, research on CWD test kits that it connects by test results? Um, I guess I don't, I don't, I'm not real familiar with uh, that. I know there's always different groups working on um, just hunter carry kits. I don't know that anything, anything has been federally approved or, um, but yeah, that's something I, I don't know. Alicia is, is taught on. I didn't see Todd on, but I know yeah. they are trying to do some more research on, you know, more quick kind of quick kits, but nothing has been approved yet, but they continue to look at better ways to do that. Okay. Um, I got one uh, directly from Chris says we have a line on video with a collar and three most grown cubs as well as a male. We travel from uh, Connecticut, I would assume, and appreciate the opportunity to participate. Hey, thanks for joining us. Um, and Greg, Greg says, shout out to Todd uh, Nordine and the Alliance team. Great customer service. I agree. Those guys do a great job out there. Um, let's see. Uh, Ken says, I want to thank all the staff I've talked uh, with over the years uh, from office staff to all conservation officers. All have been very helpful as a non-resident hunter. That's a big deal. Yep, we appreciate that. I, I can't agree more. Our, our staff do a great job uh, with all the questions they get, uh, our officers and all all that being being available to people. Do a good job. Thanks. Um, let's see. So, yeah, James asked a question: What uh, date will non-resident uh, deer tags be available in twenty twenty four? Alicia went into. Um, when those times will be, uh, what we're proposing now would be July 24th, um, and the application period would be June 3rd to June 14th, um, is what we're looking at proposing. The, if, if that doesn't pass, it, th those dates um, will be fairly similar. There's just some slight tweaks to it. But when all that, um, just keep an eye on our out for our big game guide that'll come out in May. Um, that'll have all the, the detailed information on all that. Um, Dave says, uh, Nebraska and Park staff, thanks for uh, so much all you do. Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks for being here. Um, Wayne, sa Wayne says, I think this is good dis discussion, uh, reading chats and listening to information at the same time is distracting. Um, I suggest more than one presenter and chats go only to staff. Uh, they reply after they. Yeah, I can see if you guys are trying to listen to me and then follow the chat. Um, that would have been hard. I would just say ignore the chat. <laughs> but it, yeah. I can see where some of those threads and trying to read all that would be a, a, a little confusing, but um, yeah. And maybe we, I don't know if there's a way for us to try to make that available in the, the on YouTube or not, but um, Craig asks, are you considering raising of non-resident uh, prices for antlerless tags? Um, and Alicia addressed that. Yeah, they're, they're, they are going up um, a bit um, for next year. So I think they were 77. I don't, they wouldn't go up 20 bucks, but so I think they were 77 this past year and going up to 92. Um, Jeff said, if wanting to reduce elk, ever thought of doing archery only uh, hunter's chance at a tag every year versus uh, one in a lifetime? Um, oh, 79. Yep. We, yeah, we really haven't. <laughs> I don't know that we would we would still have a pretty fair amount of harvest. Um, even if we went to archery, we still couldn't support archery elk harvest every every year. Um, the way we're doing it um, seems to provide a pretty fair opportunity for everybody um, to get a, a chance to hunt. 
Um, and even, you know, right now the, the odds on drawing a cow tag are about one in four overall. So everybody's getting a pretty good chance of getting those permits. Strangely, I still haven't drawn one, but I'm going to write something to the complaint department on that, right? Where's John Hoggett? But anyway. Um, Tom says, great meeting and information. I want to thank uh, all the staff for putting the meeting on. Hey, thanks for joining us. Really, I, like... I, I appreciate everybody coming and, and, and joining on here. Um, a lot of this stuff doesn't happen without you, um, you all being here. Um, so Rich says, Luke Nelson, and NBCB, NGPC, great presentation. And thanks for sharing the information, including the big game research being conducted, uh, your efforts to manage wildlife and balance, the competing interests among the public, landers, hunters, et cetera, appreciated. Uh, the approach to elk uh, unit 15 is also interesting and innovative funds from permits and federal grants need to continue to go towards research habitat and access and not bounty programs with no long-term benefit yeah thanks rich thanks for that input um yeah yeah thanks for the comment on that there kevin um yeah thanks a bunch guys uh brian says thanks for being so transparent luke and then gpc in GPC, I'm skipping too many letters here. Uh, river antlers tag options in high deer population areas are essential. Please continue to provide this control tool. Uh, harvest opportunities through January is important as it allows time falling muzzleloader season. Yeah, we and and we that's something we've definitely realized and recognized is that a lot of our hunters, especially areas where they, um, where where we need doe and and, and population management, where we need increased doe harvest or just you know doe harvest, is a lot of our Landowners and hunters have kind of shifted to doing that um, in the late season um, and using the the November firearm season or you know November archery season to to as their time to hunt bucks and they focus on does later and so yeah I, I agree it's not something we're going to completely go away from um, at all we realize it's an important tool um, especially along those river areas um, where we've still got got pockets of, of high deer numbers. Josh says very good presentation thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for joining us, Josh. Um, yeah, Mike says the same thing. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Um, Larry says, was wanting to know about why there's a late uh, season antelope uh, fawn and doe season, um, even the landowners are wondering. Um, that's largely due to landowner complaints about population um, issues that, that doe fawn season has been our management tool or population management tool for pronghorn. Um, and it works at a time of the year when the, the pronghorn are largely causing uh, the, the damage on, you know, uh, using wheat fields and, and all that when they concentrate in the winter. Um, so that's why that season is when it is. Um, that's something we'll also look at how, how much we need that, how much we, we still need doe harvest at this point. We know our populations are down across a, a large part of the, the West. Um, but there's, there's still likely some areas where there's some issues to pop up. But like I said, that's another thing we, we go through and we look at, we look at each and every permit, um, every year, uh, coming up here in a few weeks. Um, we actually, we've got a, a group of us that, that look at that spread from across the state. We all meet and spend about three days in one room and go through every every deer, elk, and antelope um, permit across the state and uh, discuss and sometimes argue about whether they need to go up or come down or um, all sorts of things. So it's we, we, we do go through everything with a, a, a fine tooth comb. Um, uh, Shane, says uh maybe missed it but you, uh can you provide a brief update on big orange sheep numbers yeah i you didn't miss it because i didn't include a sheep page um i think i was trying to be as quick as i could and i i probably should have included some info on sheep um and alicia addressed it there last numbers we have are from the august commission meeting pine ridge herds are at 16 to 20 wildcat hills are 325 to 335 for a total of about 340 to 350 animals um so yeah uh holy cow i think i'm getting to the bottom militia um kobe says thanks for all you do uh jeff says thanks for all the info and q a um and yeah thank you both for joining us um thanks for taking your time out of your night to to come and listen to me ramble on and, and answer questions um aaron says i think the game park should have more of these in-person uh meetings in more areas yeah we we and we try to move those around the state um every year they're they're in different locations we have eight of them um every year and it eight is about probably about as many as um we can get to re and put on reasonably 
um and we do them in december and january i'm we these last few years we've definitely made it a priority to try to get lincoln staff at at every one of them um there's several of us that are going to make probably i think many most of our lincoln staff are going to make seven out of the the eight meetings um so it's a, a pretty big time commitment for us to try to get to those they're definitely worthwhile um oh you're talking about other times of the year yeah and we 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 do some um we do have some other meetings when some other things pick, uh pop up um but yeah we, I'm just trying to think um yeah it's something we could look at i don't i don't know how many how much more uh i i do know that when we've done some of these meetings in the past um we've actually had a, a, these last couple of years we've had pretty good attendance but when our deer numbers were high um or even well i shouldn't say when deer numbers were high we had landowners showing up at them um when our deer numbers were kind of right in the middle in the you know 2015 to 2017 era we we had a number of meetings where staff were outnumbering um people at, at, attending and so it's it's a little disheartening we got to make for us to show up and then not have anybody else show up so um so you know that's it, it it's definitely something to think about um but yeah michael Lish says we're going to continue our online ones the first one was i think we i think pat and i did one in 2019 as just a trial we did a youtube live thing um we're getting all fancy with technology and stuff. And then of course, or wait, maybe that was 2020. Cause then COVID was the, the COVID when these got canceled would have been in 21. Um, and then we, I, I did eight of eight online ones in, in that year. Um, we moved that down to, I think we did one and then realized we probably should do two. Um, so we'll, we'll keep doing at least two of these online ones, um, for a total of 10 meetings, but yeah, it's, um, it's trying to find that balance of, of doing enough of this versus, uh, uh, making sure we're, we're giving people the opportunity to, to, to get to the meetings. So, but yeah, we do try to move them around the state. Um, oh, Todd was trying to chime on, but mute. I don't know that setting, but sorry about that. I don't see a mute lock thing on. So, but anyway, um uh oh change the size of my there we go yeah and and like alicia says you, you can sure give me a call if you ever want to chat about this stuff i love talking about deer and elk management um so yeah thanks for joining us uh oh pat's trying to tell us we need to we're going to need to do four different ones four different online ones, I think do what fisheries does. So, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, we're kind of getting down towards the end of the the questions here. If there's anything else that, that you guys pop and we're coming up against nine o'clock, um, should probably try to wrap things up and just be respect to, respectful of everybody's time. Um, but if there's anything else that, that pops up, um, hang on just a second. Uh, if, if you, I'm typing my email into the the search bar or the search bar, the the chat. Um it's luke.maduna at nebraska.gov. So if if you get, you know, questions that you you think of later that you want to ask, or if there's something that you're thinking of that you don't necessarily want to type out to everybody, um, you can sure shoot me an email and and I'll be happy to answer um answer your questions and, and go back and forth on on anything you got there. Um Again, I do appreciate all the input you guys have pr provided. I, you know, there, I know there's a lot of, a lot of thoughts about going to one buck and, you know, it's, that's definitely something, something for us to consider. Um, I, I don't want you to think that I was dismissing that um, at all with I, a lot of, you know, whether it's the, the season timing or, you know, one versus two bucks, you know, a lot of that is just explaining kind of why we are where we are and where we've been and, and what maybe some of those changes would, would, would look like. Um, or what the the immediate impact would be. Um, so please please don't take that as being dismissive of that answer previously. So um, with that, I, I guess I don't. It looks like we're starting to get some people bailing off anyway. Um, 
I don't think I've got anything I missed here. I th there's been a couple comments on, on some of that, but yeah, thank you all for joining us. Um, I guess with that, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and wrap it up. We haven't had any more questions. So, um, thank you all. And uh, I guess just have a great night. Um, and we'll, we'll catch you, catch you next time. And like I said, e email me if you got questions, I'm happy to chat about it. So thanks again. We will, we'll see you.